Muscle biopsy is probably not so new to mankind. Having been started way back in 1860 by Dushin, we've come a long way since. And uh, now uh, one needs to know the basic indica indications. And while we have a lot of tools in our hands compared to Dr. Dushin, we still need to be thorough with where a muscle is really indicated. Now, basically, any uh, symptoms or signs of muscle disease in the form of either weakness, fatigue, muscle pain, cramps, stiffness, or even a floppy infant at birth are indications enough for a muscle biopsy. If the patient has elevated creatinine phosphokinase or a myopathic pattern on EMG, these would also be indications to do a muscle biopsy to get to the bottom of the diagnosis. Many systemic diseases have muscle involvement, like connective tissue diseases and vasculitis. And uh, these would warrant a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. Other indications would be when there is a hereditary muscle disease in family members, or when there's a requirement to distinguish myopathic from neurogenic diseases. And in today's era of genetics, when genetics yields a diagnosis of a variant of unknown significance, then a muscle biopsy would be indicated to find the diagnosis if possible. Now, uh, basically, it is very important to choose the right site of biopsy because this, unlike other biopsies, is processed differently. And also the processes, the uh, uh, pathology may be focal. And therefore, before doing the biopsy, one must make a, do a thorough clinical examination, identify a moderately involved muscle, and preferably, if, if possible, correlate with MRI findings because imaging is very helpful in, uh, in uh, locating a moderately in involved muscle and avoid an end-stage muscle. And then mark the belly of the muscle that has been biopsied. It's very important also to avoid sites of tenderness insertion because myotenderness insertions can have certain changes, which I will show you in the next few slides, which can be extremely confounding in diagnosis and making the right diagnosis. Also, one should diligently avoid sites of EMG needling previous injections or surgery, if any. The most common muscle which is biopsied is the vastus lateralis. But depending on the muscle group involved, a biceps, gastrocnemius, or even a TBLS anterior could be chosen. But it's very important that the pathologist knows which site has been biopsied. This is because different muscles have different proportions of various fibers. And unless one knows which muscle has been biopsied, one can make a mistake in, uh, in the final diagnosis. And every lab also needs to standardize biopsies from particular fiber sites. So um, basically, the technique involved is either an open biopsy. Some centers do practice needle biopsies, but most pathologists like clot of tissue, and therefore open biopsies are preferable. Once the biopsy is done, the sample needs to be transported fresh to the lab as early as possible. And uh, all one needs to do is have a saline soaked gauze piece in which the muscle is wrapped. And if there is a transit delay, then this has to be transported in ice without ice coming to direct contact with the muscle biopsy. And one important thing to remember is that it should never be sent floating in saline because when it's floating in saline, the saline tends to get in and disrupt muscle architecture and causes a lot of confusion in diagnosis. This picture is a very big muscle and, uh, and pathologists are always happy with the big biopsies. But And this would be ideal, a five centimeter cube size of muscle. But often what we end up is with small size like this. Once the muscle biopsy arrives in the lab, it is triaged in this manner. A small bit, about 2 mm, is preserved in 3% buffered glutarality height for electron microscopy, and it's uh, saved at 4 degrees Celsius. A, a slightly bigger bit is frozen at minus 80 degrees Celsius and stored away for biochemical and genetic studies if required at a later stage. And the rest of the tissue is then processed for routine sections after cryosectioning uh, and uh, for HND and enzyme histochemistry. At this point, I'd like to share a, a short video on how we process muscle biopsies after they are received in the lab. So. Once the muscle is received in the lab, under a hand lens or a dissecting microscope, the orientation is looked at, and it's oriented such the longitudinal fibers are visible in one, one plane, and with a sharp blade, a cut is made across transversely, because transverse sections yield the maximum information. 
and therefore it's cut across the longitudinal fibers to yield a transverse section, which is then made to stand with the transverse fibers looking up. This biopsy is then moved onto a silver foil, which is then frozen in liquid isopentane. This is isopentane, which is cooled in a can of liquid nitrogen at a temperature as low as minus 170 to minus 180 degrees Celsius. The canister is lowered into the can. And as soon as the canister touches the surface of the liquid nitrogen, you can see all this, these fumes coming up, which means it has made contact. And in about 20 to 30 seconds thereafter, the isopentane is frozen. The frozen isopentane has a solid phase at the bottom and a liquid phase at the top. It's very important to stir this isopentane so that the uh, temperature is uniform all over. And then the muscle, which is held on silver foil, can be dipped into it for snap freezing. Snap freezing is an extremely important technique which hardens the tissue and freezes and preserves the enzymes and other chemicals without degeneration. This is a cryostat where the muscle biopsy is now placed onto chucks made of ice. But we, we use this after, um, uh, after what is done in MHANS, but one can always use the freezing medium OCT, which is used for all frozen sections. So it's mounted there and sections are cut. So this is where I left you and cryo sections are now cut and stored in pre-cooled foil. It's important to remember that any sections which are not used immediately for special stains can be stored away at minus 80 degrees Celsius in the freezer until, they are, uh, until the stains are ready to be done, in which case the slides have to be brought out, thawed to room temperature and stains carried out. Now, this is a picture of a well-frozen muscle which shows uniform polygonally, uh, polygonal uh, uh, fibers arranged closely opposed to each other with subsarcolemal nuclei. Sarcoloma is nothing but the plasma membrane of the muscle cell, and the nuclei are just beneath the plasma membrane. So this is uh, an ideally uh, frozen muscle with very minimal inflammation and no significant fibrosis or adipose tissue. But if care is not taken, one can end up with a lot of artifacts, and that can be really difficult for the reporting pathologist. So the picture on the left is uh, one where the sample came floating in saline. And the saline, of course, insinuates itself between the muscle fibers. The fibers look rounded and very abnormal. And that can make diagnosis extremely difficult. Alternatively, the saline may get into the muscle fiber. And because of snap freezing, ice crystals are formed. And this is typically called an ice crystal artifact, where you get holes in the muscle fibers, which could be large or small. And when small, they can, or even when they are large, one could confuse these with vacuolar myopathy seen in storage disorders. So one really needs to be extremely careful while freezing muscle. Also, as I had mentioned earlier, the site of biopsy needs to be away from the myotendinous junction and the junction with fascia. This you can see is a junction of muscle with fascia. And here you naturally find fibers which look abnormal. This fiber looks like it has multiple internal nuclei. And these fibers at the yellow arrow look atrophic which is at the insertion of the fascia. And these could actually, atrophic fibers typically are seen in neurogenic disorders and multiple central nuclei are seen in myopathic disorders. So one could make a mistaken diagnosis if uh, care is not taken to get the biopsy from the right side and freeze it in the right way. An important prerequisite, as in all biopsies and more so in non-neoplastic biopsies, is to have a detailed, uh, have to, is to have the detailed clinical findings, the age, family history, consanguinity, if any, and the developmental milestones if it's a child, and also the duration, because some uh, the tempo in certain diseases is shorter, in some it is longer. And if we have access to other clinical findings like the CPK levels, the electromyograph findings, and nerve conduction studies, that is helpful too in, our, in narrowing down the diagnosis. So most important question is that does formalin fixed tissue yield any results? Should it be done for diagnosis of muscle diseases? No, because it is very extremely limited use and it denatures all the enzymes which we need to study in great detail to arrive at the right diagnosis. The only use perhaps is that if you get a vasculitis, if you have a vasculitis and you get formalin fixed tissue, then vasculitis can be confidently and correctly diagnosed as in this picture. There is fibrinoid necrosis and dense in inflammation in the muscle in the perimycel compartment. So one can make that diagnosis confidently and correctly. Fibrosis and fat infiltration in end-stage muscle can be identified in paraffin sections. And sometimes the inflammatory infiltrate is perhaps better delineated in uh, paraffin sections. And small amyloid deposits, which could be missed on 
cryosections are probably better picked up and formalin fixed tissue. But overall, a good cryosection with enzyme stains is what one needs to make the right diagnosis. Now, a quick recap of the functional unit. The motor unit is, is the functioning unit of the muscle, and one needs to be familiar with this to be able to make the right diagnosis of these diseases. The motor unit begins with the motor neurons in the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord, and the nerve goes down and supplies the muscle. So each nerve fiber or neuron or axon from the, uh, from the anterior horn cell would supply numerous muscle fibers, and all muscle fibers supplied by a particular nerve would have the same characters. And as you can see here, the purple nerve supplies these fibers, which are all light colored. The green one supplies these, which are dark colored. This is just a simple schematic picture to show what happens in the human body. So you could have diseases either in the horn cells, either in the upper or the lower motor neuron, or there could be diseases along the nerve, or there could be diseases of the neuromuscular junction or primary muscle diseases, which involve the muscle and not any of these of the any of these parts of the motor unit. The picture on the right is just to recapitulate the normal histology and anatomy. The muscle is attached by the tendon to the bone and the external connective tissue which covers the muscle is the epimysium. This cover dips down then between the fascicles. Each one is a fascicle containing numerous muscle fibers and this envelope of connective tissue around the fascicle is the perimysium. Within the perimysium is, are the multiple muscle fibers and the connected tissue between the muscle fibers is known as the endomysium. It is good to be familiar with these terms before we go on with the next few slides. And this is of course a routine h &D section. And these are enzyme stains, which I will deal with in greater detail in the next few slides.